Good morning and pleasant Sabbath. We welcome you to our worship service today and pray that you receive the blessing you're seeking. At this time, I invite you to bow your heads as I pray. Our oh, Father, we thank you for this privilege we have of worship. This opportunity we have to hear your word. We pray that your spirit would guide us through this session. And may your name be glorified in all that we do. So bless us now. Come and tabernacle with us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. My name is Spencer Hooks, and I would like to bring to your attention the following announcements from this week's bulletin, which is distributed electronically. If you would like to join our mailing list and receive the bulletin, please go to columbiacentersda.org forward slash bulletin. You can also view the latest bulletin there. Every member is requested to attend our call-in town hall business session. Tomorrow, July 11th, at 8.45 p.m. We will discuss the latest updates to our new building at 9121 Red Branch Road. Congratulations, 2020 graduates, kindergarten through grad school. Let's celebrate you. Please share your videos or still photos of you in cap and gown so we can share this milestone in your life. Sabbath, July 18, 2020 at 3 p.m. Where do we go from here? The new church normal? Join the discussion as Dr. Milton Brown and other panelists discuss various aspects of returning to CCC amidst COVID-19. Do you have questions regarding worship service, interaction with members of the community, or how to remain safe as COVID-19 remains? Then this discussion is for you. Again, if you would like to view our announcements or join our mailing list, please go to columbiacentersda.org forward slash bulletin. Today, the CCC family would like to recognize Mika Byam, Christine Williams, and Jeffrey Brooks, who celebrated their birthdays this week. We hope you had a blessed birthday, and we wish you a safe and spirit-filled year. I invite all our CCC members, as well as our friends who are watching this stream, to join me as I approach God's throne of grace. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come to you this morning because you are our creator, our redeemer, our sustainer, and our prayer answering God. We come, Lord, in the midst of a world that seems to be spinning out of control and all the circumstances around us that cause for anxiety and fear and concern. As we come this morning, we thank you that we serve a God who hears and answers prayer and who will reach into our circumstances to do that which is best for us. As we come this morning, we present our praise and thanks for all the blessings that we have received at your hand. And we present all our concerns. You know them all, Lord. Those that we have dared to speak loud, those that we have written, and those that are in the deepest recesses of our hearts, such deep and personal desires that only you can know about. And we thank you that you see and hear each one of us and our hearts cries. So hear the pleas this morning for healing for all those who feel afflicted in some way because of health challenges, place your healing hand upon them. Be with those, Lord, who are concerned about finances, those who are concerned about family. Lord, meet the needs of each one. 
we pray for our children, for the challenges that they face growing up in this difficult world. We ask that you place a hedge of protection around them and give us godly wisdom and help us to lean on you as we pray for them, for their deliverance. We pray for those who have been adversely affected by the circumstances around us. And we ask that you would bless our efforts to work with you to reach into their difficult circumstances and provide whatever we can to alleviate their concerns and grant that in doing so, they may see in us hope in a God who delivers. We ask for wisdom and guidance for our nation's leaders and our church's leaders and ask that you will remind them that righteousness exalts a nation and so they need to look to you for wisdom and guidance. We ask that your hand will rest upon your manservant this morning as he brings us a word from you. May our hearts be open and ready to receive it so that as we go into a new week, the words you send our way will ring in our ears and inform the way we walk and talk this week. Hear our breathings and do for us what we cannot do for ourselves and we thank you and praise you in the name of your Son and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and Amen. Oh, I'd 
Good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath. It is a joy to be back home, being able to worship together. Last week, we spent the Sabbath celebration in our virtual camp meeting, and we want to thank uh, the administration and all of the staff and the workers and the departmental secretaries uh, for putting on a, such an excellent program, especially uh, Sister Latasha Hewitt and Brother Charles Williams of the Communications and Technology Departments and their respective staffs. Thank you so much. You truly blessed us and all of the workers who were involved in that massive production. Uh, these are exciting times here at Columbia Community Center. As we all know, uh, we went to closing on June the 18th. A number of ministry events have already started taking place at 9121 Red Branch Road. I want to encourage our members, by the way, that if you have not gotten out much, and if you have not gone by the building, why don't you hop in your car this afternoon, take a ride over, you'll see our signs already up on the building, identifying it as God's place of uh, Columbia Community Center. And uh, just go by, drive through the parking lot. Uh, we will be coming out with uh, more information, especially tonight, in our town hall business meeting, which we hope everyone will participate in, where we, where we will be giving you more updated information. Uh, I wanna thank the project management committee for the hard work that they are doing, working with the architect as we are moving forward. This is a day that we have been longing for, praying for uh, since our inception in 1996. And God has been so gracious to us. He is faithful to his people. So we just want to pause and praise his holy name. I'm not gonna preach long today. I just have a few things I want to share with you. But first I want to thank Covered, uh, Colleen, Denise, and Linda uh, for that wonderful selection from one of our previous services. I'd rather have Jesus more precious than silver and gold. And that's who I wanna talk about today, our blessed savior. Won't you bow your heads with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you for the Sabbath, a time when we can pause and reflect upon your goodness, where we can have 24 hours of uninterrupted uh, silence and meditation and praise and thanksgiving to you, where the power of our intellect and the focus of our emotions are centered upon you, where all of our attention and affections are lavished upon you in this relationship of intimacy that you have for us today. So we are grateful. And as we enter into the didactic and the proclamation portion of our service, please anoint us with your Holy Spirit that we will determine and will be able to decipher and discern your holy impress and imprint upon your precious word is my prayer in Jesus name. Amen. Today I want to share with you a few thoughts and the subject is entitled Eyes Wide Shut. In the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 20, and John chapter 20, Luke 24, but we find the same account of Jesus coming from the tomb. There are three women, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome. The Sabbath hours have ended. They rush out to buy burial spices uh, by which they plan to anoint Jesus's body because he has just been murdered by the people of God and the powers of Rome on Friday. And in keeping with the Sabbath hours, they didn't even use or implement the normal Jewish ritual of having the body anointed immediately. So Jesus rested in the tomb the entire Sabbath day. And Saturday night they go out and they buy the spices with the intent of early Sunday morning of going to anoint his body. The gospel account records that Mary and her other two comrades at sunrise are making their way to 
Joseph's tomb where Jesus has been laid. And as they're traveling, the author says that they begin to query each other. Who in the world is going to roll away this stone once we get there? Not having an answer to that interrogative, the account lets us know that an angel is sent from heaven. And when he hits the earth at its impact, there is a great earthquake and this angel from heaven rolls the stone away. Now, I don't know the perfect sequence, but when I piece together this account from all four gospels, we know that that earthquake happened and the stone was rolled away before Mary got to the tomb. They arrive and they look in the tomb and there is a man, a young man dressed in white, sitting on the right hand side. And he asked them the question, why do you seek the living among the dead? This same Jesus, who's told you he was going to die and in three days would rise again. Well, guess what? He is risen. Now, he told you all that he would meet you in Galilee. So you need to go and tell his disciples. And then the angel adds, and Peter. Now, if we were in our church in a worship service, I would have time to truly unpack this. But I just want to do a quick sidebar. You, you see, Jesus, knowing how distraught Peter was because of his denial, he wanted that first message post-resurrection to go to the disciples, but also to let Peter know in spite of his renunciation of Jesus on Friday and on Thursday evening, in spite of that, the message of repentance, the message of reconciliation and divine forgiveness was still being extended to Peter when he was at his lowest ebb. Talk about eyes wide shut. So Mary runs, the, the account tells us, she lets Peter and the disciples know, and they think that they are insane. They think that these women are crazy. Well, Peter and John, the one whom Jesus loved, they race to the tomb. And in the Gospel of John in chapter 20, John records, he outran Peter. He beats him there, but when he gets to the tomb, he is apprehensive. I would dare say he is fearful because he doesn't want to go into the tomb. When Peter finally catches up, Peter barges in with his impetuous self, fearless and dauntless. He barges in and he sees that Jesus is not there. He comes out and he is bewildered. They're shook. But John records when he then goes in after Peter has gone in and he sees the garments thrown to the side, but the napkin or the cloth that covered Jesus's face is neatly folded. Ellen White says that, that that napkin that covered his face neatly folded was done by Jesus himself when he rose, giving the indication that he keeps everything and does everything in perfect order. John writes that he then himself believed that Jesus was alive. Peter and John, Go back to the other disciples to tell them of this, this strange event that the body of Jesus has been taken. Uh, if you do another sidebar real quick, the gospel authors also let us know that these soldiers who were, at, who were standing guard at Jesus' tomb, when the angel came and rolled the stone away, they fell like dead men. By the time they had recollected themselves, mystified by what they had witnessed, they make their way back to Pilate, but they are intercepted by the high priest and the temple guards. And they persuade them to lie to Pilate, to let them know or to tell Pilate that they had fallen asleep and the disciples came and stole Jesus's body. You see, you can't ever trust Satan to play fair. He will always have a trick up his sleeve. He will always mix a little truth with a whole lot of error to confuse and to confound. But in spite of that lie, the Bible tells us in Mark chapter 16 and verse 9 that Mary Magdalene, the one whom Jesus had cast out seven devils, the one who washed Jesus' feet 
with an alabaster of oil of expensive perfume and then dried his feet with her hair. She was given the privilege of being the very first one to see the risen Lord. And so here is Mary at the tomb crying and, and, and she's wondering where in the world have they taken her precious savior. She came on a mission of mercy and complete adoration and affection because she wanted to anoint his body. When men and his followers and even his disciples had abandoned him, they don't, did not want to be associated with him lest the same fate that fell upon Jesus would fall upon them, but not Mary. Mary had experienced the rich and deep vein of forgiveness that Jesus had extended to her, washing away her sins, while others still confronted her and held that proverbial sword of Damocles over her head, reminding her of her past. The stain of a, of a sinful and adulterous lifestyle still lingered when she would walk into the temple or into the synagogue yeah, they would re look at her, but you could tell that there was still that residual effect of her past sins still lingering there. But yet Jesus is the one who tells her, you are forgiven, my daughter. She has the privilege of being the first one to see Jesus, but unfortunately, she does not recognize him. In fact, the Bible tells us in John 20 that she sees Jesus standing there but she mistakes him to be a gardener. And she asked that wonderful question, sir, tell me where you have laid him. I will go and get him. What a term and a statement of affection. This is a woman who was wondering when she was making her way to the tomb, who would roll away the stone. She is now, she is now by herself. So how is it possible that she by herself could possibly retrieve the body of Jesus, dead weight, and bring him back to this tomb. It was her heart full of love and affection and a deep appreciation. And it went more than just from a personal relationship with Jesus, but it had deep spiritual ties. Her soul was anchored in Jesus, and therefore she wanted to do anything and everything possible to restore him to a place of peace. So she looks at this gardener, looking at him, asking him, where have you laid Jesus? And it is not until Jesus speaks to her and he says, Mary. He calls her by name, Mary. All of a sudden, I can envision with my eye, with a proleptic eye of faith, the scales uh, figuratively fall from her eyes and now she is able to behold her blessed savior and redeemer. But before he spoke to her, she was there looking at him with her eyes wide shut. How is it that she could see Jesus but not recognize? Possibly one of the reasons is that her heart was so full of grief and brokenness. All of her hopes and aspirations and her trust in Jesus was rooted and founded in his very word. For Jesus had declared in John 6, 63, my words are spirit and life. She had been a witness and understood of the potency and the power of Jesus's word. It was his command outside of Lazarus' tomb that called Lazarus forth from that darkened tomb. It was his word that commanded the pallbearers and the mourners to loose him and let him go as they unwrapped the burial cloth from around Lazarus. Mary Magdalene had seen the power of Jesus' word as demons and evil spirits that had possessed men and women the moment they saw Jesus, they would fall down to the ground and they would beg Jesus not to kill them, not to send them into the bottomless pit. 
and at his word and at his command, they had to obey. Here is Jesus whom she had experience with. She had heard and seen him teach and touch, but yet she's looking at him and doesn't recognize him, possibly as I mentioned, because her eyes were full of grief. How many times have we been looking at Jesus but not recognized him? Have our hearts been so full of grief and remorse and brokenness that we come to him but yet we don't receive the full impact and the power of his embrace because our brokenness, our disjointedness, possibly the guilt and the remorse of past sins, of failed behavior, eclipses us from being able to see him and to experience him. Possibly it's because of our anger. Possibly we are seeing Jesus with our eyes wide shut because we still hold racist tendencies and prejudicial biases, whether personally or structurally. I have news for you, saints of God. We can sing when we all get to heaven as long as we want until we turn blue in the face. But as long as racism, as long as bigotry, is active in our lives that distorts how we look at men and women regardless of their color. We can sing when we all get to heaven, but we all ain't going and we will all not get there. The message that Jesus has for us in John 20 with Mary and her eye, looking at Jesus and her eyes are wide shut. How many times have we come to church? How many sermons have we listened to? How many praise teams have we celebrated? How many camp meetings have we gone to? How many Bible studies? How many sermons have I preached? But have I been looking at him and my eyes are still wide shut? No. Mary didn't recognize him. And I would dare say the thing that keeps us from recognizing him is when Instead of looking through with the eyes of faith, we are looking with the vision of presumption. Instead of us appropriating Jesus experientially, we merely deal with him from pure, unabated emotions. Instead of loving him with all of my heart, I serve him from the lust of the desires that I want him to fulfill. In order for me to experience the liberating power of Jesus, I'm talking about that liberation of power when you read in, in, in the Gospel of Mark, around chapter 9, after Jesus has been, and I hope you all are still with me, after Jesus has been on the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John, and they have experienced this wonderful symbolism of the power of the kingdom of God. In fact, that's what Jesus meant in chapter nine of Mark and verse one. He said, some of you standing here today, you, won't, you will see the kingdom of God coming in its power before you die. And about six days later, as you go on in, in Mark nine and verse two, Jesus takes these three men, I call them his kitchen cabinet, his closest advisors, those who experience specific miracles, uh, by Jesus, those who he took into his inner confidence. He takes them up on this Mount of Transfiguration. And as he is praying, the word of God says that his clothing turned as white as any bleachers form formulation could make it. His face changed, his clothes changed. And then Moses and Elijah appear and they are talking to Jesus and ministering to him. And Peter is so impetuous he says, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Let's make three tabernacles. I can imagine James and John are so stupefied and they're wondering in their minds, 
Why doesn't this fool just shut his mouth and take it in? And then Mark says, a cloud overshadowed them and a voice of God calls out, this is my, de my dearly beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then God gives a directive, listen to him. As they make their way down the mountain, Jesus tells these three men, he says, don't tell anybody what you have seen and witnessed here until after I have been crucified and I'm raised from, and I, and I rise from the dead. Mark says that they all were wondering amongst themselves, what does he mean by rising from the dead? Because they didn't understand. And then they come down to the other disciples and Mark says there is a large crowd and there's a great commotion because a man whose young son is possessed by an evil spirit brought him to the other uh, nine disciples asking them to cast out the demon and they could not do it. And so they bring him to Jesus and Mark writes, as soon as the evil spirit lays eyes on Jesus, he throws the young boy down, foaming at the mouth, grinding his teeth, writhing in pain. And Jesus asks the man, how long has he been like this? And the father tells Jesus. And then the word says, Jesus commanded the evil spirit to come out of him. And he comes out. And this young lad now sits there in his right mind, calm, in perfect order. The spirit is gone. Mary sees this. She sees the power of Jesus. And what he wanted her to understand is the same thing he wants you and he wants me to understand. That in order to experience that power, my eyes can't be wide shut. My eyes must be open. And the way that our eyes are opened is when I take Jesus at his word, when he says you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Now, folk, I want to talk to you very plainly today. You see, the time of playing church is over. COVID-19 and this global pandemic has shaken all of us to our very core. It is a wake up call. We are not doing church like we used to do. The old normal is gone. We look at the news and we listen to the news and we see the reports and in spite of the political powers of our country at its highest level, in spite of the occupant in the Oval Office right now, even though he and his minions continue to let us know that the country is quote, in a good place. Are you kidding me? In a good place? More than 130,000 deaths? All the millions of cases? More than 60,000 in a given day? States that are on the rise again? You see what's happening in California, in Arizona, in Texas, and in Florida, and 30 other states comprised of our great country. This is no time to play church. This is no time to have our eyes wide shut. This is the time for us to believe in what Jesus said here in his word. He said, my words are spirit and they are life. There is power. There is power in his blood that forgives us of our sins that restores us to the Father, that gives us access to the Father. There is power because he has promised to give us his Holy Spirit. Jesus has the power to mend that broken heart. It is his power that co-joins with our surrendered will. And for those of us who need external help, who need other types of professional of psychological and medical intervention from men and women that God has entrusted with 
mental powers and medicinal powers and medical awareness and acumen so that there can be liberation, so that there can be freedom, so that habits can be broken. The Gospel of Mark also tells us that there is a problem with the detox, with, with, the, with the toxicity of sin. And the best way that you and I, in fact, the only way that you and I can detox, go through detoxing, is through the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So therefore, when I see him, I can see him for as he is because I know and you know that we will be changed and transformed into his likeness. The time is now, the time is here when there is an appetite that men and women have. There is a desire. People are searching because people are scared. Now is when Jesus needs us to step into the gap. And so I'm asking you, CCC members and our friends, to recommit yourself to Jesus Christ. To, to say, Lord, here is my life. I give it to you with, without any caveats. I am trusting you. Here's my heart. Here is my life. Here is my family. I'm putting it all into your hands, Lord. Now you take me. You use me. You show me. So that I can see you. With the eye of faith. Where I will experience you. Where I will appropriate you. Not using you but being used by you. Family, I'm asking God, even in this COVID environment, to use us and to fulfill our commitment to be his lighthouse, to be his evangelistic arm, to be his mouthpiece that is spreading the glad tidings of the gospel of Jesus. I'm asking God to fulfill his word when he said, how blessed are the feet of those who bring the gospel. Well, here in Columbia, CCC is committed of bringing the gospel in word, in deed, and in action. My prayer is that you will unite with Christ then you will unite with us as we unite together to give this message of hope and joy and restoration to a dying world. If that is your desire and if that is your commitment, then I ask you to pray with me today. Dear Jesus, Thank you so much for loving us and saving us. Thank you for being committed to us so much so that you divested yourself of all of heaven and took on the cloak of humanity and not only walked this earth, but did ministry that reunited us with the Father. And now if that wasn't enough, Jesus, you have called us to be partners with you, co-laborers. In fact, we are ministers of the reconciliation. So fill us now, Lord. Open doors that no man can close. Then close those doors that no man can open. But it is all for the fulfillment of your purpose. We pray for every member that is sick, affirmed. 
We pray, O oh Lord, that you will be with them, that you will cause your spirit to whisper in their ear that you are right there with them. We pray that they will feel your warm embrace and will not let go. We pray for the caregivers. We pray, O oh Lord, that there will be a special anointing of your Holy Spirit that will not only fall down upon CCC and every member and every officer and every family, but we're praying, Lord, for every church in our metro area, every church and pastor in Allegheny East Conference, in this union, in this division, in this worldwide church and body of believers. Send your Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus. This is our prayer. And we thank you for hearing and answering. In the sweet name of our Lord and Savior. Amen and amen. We would like to say a heartfelt thank you to all our CCC members and friends who have continued to support the ministry of Columbia Community Center of Seventh-day Adventists. God has been good to us, providing for us, and it is a privilege for us to be able to return something to Him in support of His work. We encourage our members to continue your online giving and your other forms of supporting the ministry and invite our friends to look at your screen and see the ways in which you can contribute through Cash App or PayPal. Thank you so much for your continued support of the ministries at Columbia Community Center of Sunday Adventists. Let us pray. Loving Father, we thank you for your continued provision, for blessing us so that we can bless others. We ask that you would take that which we have given, multiply it, bless it, Lord, so that the gospel can go forth. We ask that you would continue to bless us and to remind us that we can never outgive you. And as we come to the end of this service today, Lord, we ask that your spirit will continue to abide with us. We pray that you will remind us that you are walking with us along the paths that we will travel in the week ahead. May we have your divine benediction and may we feel your spirit's presence as we walk this way. Continue to bless us and come quickly, Lord Jesus, we pray. In your blessed name, amen. Thank you for fellowshipping with us here at Columbia Community Center. May God be victorious in your life this week, and we look forward to worshiping with you again next Sabbath.